Hey, y'all. You know what time it is? <laughs> oh, no. There we go. Wow. Get into it. <laughs> Get into it. Hi, y'all. I'm back. My goofy self is back. <clears throat> With another reading of Brian Jake's Redwall series. Now, all of the recent readings that we have done with this from chapters 1 through 12 are up on the YouTube channel. So if you are trying to play catch up, those videos are available to you on Facebook Live as well as the YouTube channel. Please, please go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube channel. It doesn't take that long. Hopefully y'all can see because I know my lighting is a little bit off. I'm going to get... Y'all, just be patient with me. I'm gonna get one of those rings that they have for YouTubers. Those, like, um, high LED ring lights. So y'all can see my face. I mean, obviously you can see me, but, like, just need a little bit more light on these edges. Or the lack thereof. <laughs> yes, I did get my booster shot today for the Pfizer vaccine. Um, I am fully vaccinated prior to that. I just wanted to get the booster because I will be going out of town. Um, in the next few weeks because in, uh, last time I checked, 16 days, I will be turning 30 years old. So excited. Let me tell you something. And a lot of people have been very surprised at my response when I say that I'm excited to turn 30. Let me tell you why. Because I have been through so much in life, especially in my adult life, mostly my teenage life. Um, there's just situations, traumatic situations that I've been in that, um, emotionally that have caused me a lot of stress in my adult life. And then I had even worse stuff happen in my adult life. But what I will say is even through all of the pain and the trauma that I may have experienced, um, in college and even in high school dealing with people, certain individuals, I'm still here. I'm still thriving. I'm doing what I can to be healthy. I take my elderberry juice, my... Elderberry syrup, elderberry tea, anything elderberry, it is great for you. Please take it, y'all. Black and brown people, take elderberry. It's good for you. It helps build your immune system. Um, if you can find some goldenrod and make that into a tincture, it's also good for you. Um, please, take care of yourself, people. Life is too short not to have fun with the ones you love. Just saying. So I'm going out of town. I'm going to be in Miami for a week. Um, if any of my friends that live near the Florida AMU area for that university or any of my friends in Atlanta that want to drive down to come see me and come hang out for the weekend, please let me know. I would love to see y'all celebrate because age is a state of mind. Aging is an inevitability. Keep in mind, you are going to get old. You are going to grow old. It is a thing. Nothing can change that unless the government has, for some reason, has a magic pill that can reverse the aging process. Which last time I don't, I checked, it ain't cold cream. Okay, it ain't that ain't it. But for me, I grew up with an amazing show that is turning 35 years old. The Golden Girls. Shout out to Sophia, Blanche, Rose, and Dorothy, aka B. Arthur, uh, Rue McClanahan, Estelle Getty. And Betty Davis. Shout out to those women. Because they made it. And especially the women in my family. Um, on both sides. They made me believe that no matter how old I get. As long as you take good care of yourself. And you do right by people. God is going to bless you with good health and good age. And you can do it. You can totally do it. And for me, that's why I do what I do with Storytime with Chris. I want to put out good, positive energy and uplift people in a powerful way just by reading. It may seem simple to you and foolish, but it's the love for me. It's the positivity for me. It's the optimism for me. I saw earlier today a video that said, how can you have a hot girl summer when you're sleepy at 9 p.m. Uh, first of all, how did you get into my diary? Second of all, um, you don't know me that well. No, um, you know, as we get older, our maturity level increases, but that doesn't mean that you necessarily should use your childlike spirit and the love and the memories of your childhood because 
those memories and even the memories of your adult life in your 20s and your experiences that, that you have can be helpful to someone who is younger than yourself. Be a big brother, a big sister, or a mentor to someone who is younger than yourself so that they don't go through what you went through at a specific point in their life. The more you know. Um, I don't own the music that is being played in the background, which is Dragon Quest VI, which honestly, I played this before a while ago. It has to be one of my favorite video game soundtracks. Just fits with the medieval, adventurous story elements that we are discussing in this but without further ado because I have to hit the gym later let's begin with the story chapter 13 the sun's rays flung wide the gates of dawn the inhabitants of Redwall were already up and about after breakfast the abbot issued daily orders all those not employed defending the abbey would husband the crops and gather in supplies for the larders in the event of a prolonged siege. Young otters collected watercress and fished. Cornflower headed a party of mice to reap the early cereal crops. More youngsters tended the salad gardens. The bright summer morning hummed to the bustle of industrious woodlanders. Which, by the way, children, a siege is to describe a... Let me articulate this in the easiest way I can for those who are young. Um, a siege is to describe a military tactic where... Let me give an example. Let's say this cup is my castle. It is my home. It is my fortress. It is where, like, all of my soldiers are kept, right? And I have invading forces of people on the outside of this cup. A siege is a lockdown, a forced lockdown, to make sure that the enemy cannot get within the castle, the fortress, the abbey, whatever the case may be. And so when you're under siege, it's always really good to prepare to have extra food, ration supplies, medical supplies, so that you can hold out for as long as possible. I like that angle better. So you hold out as long as possible while, you know, keeping the enemy at bay. It's not good to be in a siege, but if you do get sieged, or if you have to perform a siege of some kind, it's good to be prepared. Ambrose Spike, now sufficiently recovered, sat in the storeroom taking stock. Lots of nuts and preserved berries from last autumn. Apples and pears aplenty. Unfortunately, the hedgehog could not check the cellars. Brother Edmund and Friar Hugo had the only two keys. He licked his lips at the thought of barrels of nut brown ale, strong cider, creamy stout, and the little kegs. Ah, oh, the dear little kegs. Full of elderberry wine, mulberry brandy, black currant port, and wild grape sherry. This sounds really delicious. Uh, your inch peak. Where must I put these roots and dandelions? Ace them up. They am brown heavy. Ambrose sighed wistfully as he attended the two moles staggering under a bundle of dandelions and tubbers. Er, hold a little tater steady, Miller. Tip em up and let go. More baby moles. Ambrose pawed the bandage on his wound. A hedgehog's work was never done. Matthias and Constance stood in the cloisters. They had taken charge of weapon training. The Woodlanders were each showing off their special skills. In more peaceful days, these skills had only been used at fairs and sporting contests, but now when they need a rose, they would be used with more deadly effect. The otters carried bags of smooth pebbles, which they hurled from fine slings with great force and accuracy. Groups of field mouse archers knocked thistle-down shafts to the strings of their longbows. Many a marauding bird had been driven off by these same tiny archers. Bands of red wall mice practiced at thrust and parrying with staves. Below the wall on the abbey grass, Formo directed his crew as they dug a trench. This was lined with sharpened stakes by a solitary beaver. A system of ropes and pulleys carried the baskets of stone and trench debris up to the ramparts. Defenders piled it in heaps at the edge of the parapet. Matthias took a group of red wall mice to instruct in the use of the quarterstaff. He had discovered in himself a natural skill with the long ash pole. None of the mice had ever competed in any type of violent sport. They were awkward, timid. But as it was a personal choice between learning 
cudgel and wrestling from Constance or quarterstaff from Matthias to a mouse they had opted for the latter. Matthias found he had been quite severe with them. Accordingly, he dealt out some hefty blows and hard falls to make the more timid souls angry enough to retaliate. Keep that head guarded, brother Anthony. Thwack! I warned you, brother. Now look out! I'm coming after you again. Thwack! No, no, don't just stand there, brother. Defend yourself! Hit out at me! Thwack! Crack! This time, Matthias sat down hard, rubbing dazedly at his sore head. Constance chuckled. Well, Matthias, you've only yourself to blame. You asked Brother Anthony to hit it out in you, and my word, he's certainly obliged. I'll have to recruit him for my cudgel class. He shows promise. Matthias stood up, smiling ruefully. He rested up on his staff. Yes, he's very strong, but I do wish we had some real weapons of war. Swords and daggers and such like. We won't kill many rats with wooden staves. Maybe not, the badger replied. But you must remember that we are here to defend, not to attack or kill. Matthias threw down his staff. He took a dipper of water from his oaken pail. Oh, excuse me. Drank deeply, then splashing the remains over his aching head. A wise observation, Constance, but you try telling that to Cluny and his horde. See how far you get. Lunch that day was served out in the orchard. Matthias lined up with the other woodland creatures to collect his food. A bowl of fresh milk, a hunk of wheat and loaf, and some goat's milk cheese. Cornflour was serving. She gave Matthias an extra large wedge of the cheese. He rolled up the sleeve of his habit and pulled out the corner of her scarf. Look, Cornflower, a very close friend gave me this last night. She laughed at him. Get along, get along, Matthias, and eat your lunch. Warrior Mouse, or I'll show you my deadly aim with a piece of this cheese. Strolling through the dappled shade of the orchard, Matthias sought out old Methuselah, slumping down beneath a damson tree. The young mouse munched away at his lunch. Methuselah was sitting with his back against the tree, his eyes closed in an apparent doze. Without opening them, he addressed Matthias. Oh, how does the practice war, young stave master? <laughs> Matthias watched some of the tiny ants carrying off his fallen breadcrumbs as he answered, <clears throat> As well as possible, brother Methuselah. And how are your studies coming along? Methuselah squinted over the top of his spectacles. Knowledge is a thing that one cannot have enough of. It is the fruit of wisdom to be eaten carefully and digested fully. Unlike that lunch you are bolting down, little friend. <laughs> Matthias set his food to one side. Tell me, what knowledge have you digested lately, old friend? Methuselah took a sip from Matthias's milk bowl. Sometimes I think you're a very old head for such a young mouse. What more do you wish to know about Martin the Warrior? Matthias looked surprised. How did you know I was going to ask about Martin? Methuselah wrinkled his nose. How do the bee folk know that there's pollen in a flower? Ask away, young one, before I doze off again. Matthias hesitated a moment and blurted out, Brother Methuselah, tell me where Martin lies buried. The old mouse chuckled dryly. <laughs> Next you're going to ask me where to find the great sword of the warrior mouse. But how do you know that, stammered Matthias. The ancient gatehouse keeper shrugged his tiny shoulders. The sword must lie buried with Martin. You would have little use for the dusty bones of a bygone warrior. A simple deduction even for one as old as I am. Then you know where the warrior lies? Methuselah shook his head. That is a thing no creature knows. For many long years now I have puzzled and pored over ancient manuscripts, translating, following hidden trails, always with the same result. Nothing. I have used even my gift of tongue speaking to the bees and others who go into places too small for us, but always it is the same. Rumors, legends, and old mouse tales. Matthias crumbled more bread for the ants. Then the warrior's sword is only a fable? Methuselah leaned forward indignantly. 
Who said that? Did I? No, but you... Bah! Nothing of the sort. Young Mouse, listen carefully to me. I have an uncanny feeling that you may be the one I've been saving this vital piece of information for. Matthias forgot his lunch. He listened attentively. About four summers ago, I treated a sparrow hawk who had been pulled a sinew in her foot. She could not use her talons properly. Hmm, as I remember, I made her a promise never to take a mouse's prey. She was a fierce, frightening bird. Have you ever been up close to a sparrow hawk? No, of course you haven't. <laughs> well, let me tell you, they can hypnotize small creatures with those savage golden eyes. Born killers they are, but this hawk said something that made me think. She talked of the sparrows, called them winged mice, said that many years ago they had stolen something from our abbey. A treasure that belonged to the mice. Wouldn't say what it was, just flew off. Ha! Who expects gratitude from a sparrow hawk anyway? Matthias interrupted. Have you ever spoken to the sparrows about this something? Methuselah shook his head. I'm too old. I can't climb up to the roof where they nest. Besides, the sparrows are odd birds, forever quarreling and chattering on in their strange voices. They are warlike creatures, extremely forgetful. Excuse me, and completely savage. They throw you from the roof and kill you before you had a chance to get near their tribal nest. Yes, I'm far too old for that sort of thing, Matthias. Anyhow, I'm not too sure that the Spadohawk's story was true. Some birds can be dreadful liars when they have a mind to be. <laughs> Matthias tried questioning Brother Methuselah further, but the warm sun had worked its magic from the old gatekeeper as he sat in the orchard, savoring the peace and tranquility of a June afternoon. This time, there was no deception. He was genuinely fast asleep. Chapter 14 Clouds drifted across the sky, obscuring the thin sliver of moon. The Joseph Bell tolled out its midnight message to the slumbering countryside. A warm, soft drizzle was falling over the parched meadows and dry woodland, bringing relief after the hot, dry day, dampening down the dust from the road. In the ditch, a frog opened its eyes, disturbed by some slight noise from the hedgerow. It blinked. Was that three figures creeping along? Or two? The frog remained perfectly still. There seemed to be two figures in some sort of shadow. The moon came out from behind a cloud. It was two huge rats and a dark, shadowy something. There crept along under cover of the hedge towards the big dwelling of the mouse folk. Rats were hunters. Thankfully, they had not noticed him. The frog stayed motionless and let them pass. It was none of his business. Clooney, Ragger, and Shadow padded noiselessly towards Redwall. This was such an important mission that Clooney had decided to come along and supervise it personally. Around Shadow's waist was strapped a skin pouch. It contained a thin, strong rope, a padded grappling hook, a vial of oil, some lockpicks, and a dagger. Shadow's usual burgling kit. Ragier ambled proudly along, thrilled that he had been select, specially picked to accompany his chief on such a vital task. <clears throat> Little did he know that Clooney had only indulged him as an insurance. If they should get into a tight corner, Ragier would serve as an uh, expendable fool. That way Clooney could make good his own escape. The hero halted beneath the lofty abbey walls. Clooney silenced them with a wave of his tail that vanished into the night. Ragier felt distinctively nervous at being left alone with Shadow. He attempted a whispered conversation. Okay, so... Okay. I thought I had lost my place, y'all. Yeah. Hold on. There we go. Nice drops of rain, eh, Shadow? Good for the grass. Blow me, these walls are pretty high. I'm glad it's you climbing them and not me. <laughs> I never make it. <laughs> Too fat. <laughs> Ragir's voice trailed off. He fumbled with his whiskers, whittling beneath the basilisk stare of Shadow's dead black eyes. He shuddered and fell silent. Within ten minutes, Clooney was back. He nodded up at the parapet. 
I have been up and down the length of the wall for a fair distance. The sentry mice are all asleep. <laughs> the fools. They've never had to do guard duty before. As soon as night falls, so do their eyelids. That's what soft living does for you. Ragir's head bobbed in agreement. <laughs> You're right, Chief. If they were in our army and old Red Tooth caught them snoozing, he... Shut your trap, stupid! Clooney hissed. Are you ready, Shadow? Now don't forget your instructions. Shadow bared his yellowed fangs and started climbing. Slowly, he made his way upwards like a long black reptile, his claws seeking hidden niches and crevices in the sandstone, ever upwards, sometimes stopping spread-eagled across the surface as he figured out his next movement, taking full advantage of every crack and joint in the wall. No other animal in Clooney's army could have attempted such an ascent. But Shadow was a climbing expert. He concentrated his whole being on the job in hand, sometimes clinging to the stones by no more than a single claw. Below on the ground, Clooney and Ragir strained their eyes upwards. They could hardly make out his shape. He was not far from the top of the wall. Shadow shifted position and leveled with his back legs and tail. Now he wedged his claws into a fissure and stretched upwards, gaining inch by inch. On top of the wall, Brother Edmund was snoring gently. He was nestled in a pile of rubble, wrapped in a warm blanket with his hood up against the light rain. Edmund was oblivious to the long, sharp claws that latched themselves over the parapet edge. A moment later, the sleek, black head appeared. Two dense obsidian eyes stared at the sleeping mouse. Shadow has succeeded in climbing the abbey wall. Like a sinuous black lizard, he slithered past slumbering creatures and around rubble heaps, never once making a sound. Friar Hugo mumbled gently in his sleep and moved his head so that his cowl slid off. Drizzle fell upon the fat friar's face, threatening to wake him. Gently as a night breeze, Shadow replaced the hood. Pausing for an instant, Shadow looked about before descending the stone steps from the ramparts to the cloisters. So Shadow is sneaky, but he's cool. He put the hood back on the fryer so he wouldn't wake up for the rain, and so he didn't get wet. I think he's a cool guy. I mean, he's stealing, obviously, but keeping that in mind. Using shrubs and bushes as cover, he moved fur furtively forwards, never taking any needless chances or making sudden movements. Sometimes he stopped and waited, letting the minutes tick away as he planned his next progression, gliding like a cloud's shadow cast upon the ground by the moon. The door to Great Hall was not locked. Shadow judged that the latch was probably old and creaky. He took out the vial of oil and lubricated the latch and hinges. Carefully, he inched the door ajar apart from a tiny squeak. It swung effortlessly open. Sliding inside, he released the door by mistake. Swift night breeze slammed it shut with a dull thud. Shadow cursed inwardly and flung himself behind a nearby pillar. He lay inert, not daring to breathe. One, two, three minutes. Good. Nobody had been disturbed by the noise. He ventured out to inspect the tapestry that hung upon the wall. A black moth on a moonless night would not have escaped Shadow's notice. He needed no lamp to scrutinize the thing before him. So this was the picture of the warrior mouse that Clooney lusted after. Using his razor-sharp fangs, he began gnawing into the ancient tapestry, working from the tasseled hem upwards. Matthias tossed and turned in his bed, exhausted but unable to sleep. His mind revolved around a host of problems and schemes. The sword, Martin's grave, defense of the abbey, cornflower. Finally, after much kicking and rumbling of sheets, sleep started to take over. He was somewhere in a long, deserted room, not unlike Great Hall. A voice called to him. Matthias! Oh, go away! The young mouse muttered drowsily. Get someone else! I'm tired! But the voice persisted, boring into his mind. Matthias! Matthias! I need you! He peered down the length of the darkened hall. What is it? What do you want from me? Matthias began to walk towards the voice. He could hear a wicked snigger followed by a cry of despair. Matthias, help! Don't let them take me! He ran forwards. The hall seemed to grow longer. Who are you? Where are you? Far ahead in the murky darkness, Matthias could vaguely distinguish a figure leaning out from the wall. It was a mouse in armor. Please, Matthias! You must help me! Quickly! Matthias landed on the floor of his bedroom. Sheets were tangled about his body. Slowly, he sat up and rubbed his eyes. What 
What a strange dream. The long haul, the plea for help, and the armored mouse. Matthias felt the fur on the back of his neck rising. Of course, it had to be. Great Hall, Martin the Warrior, something terrible was going on downstairs. He was needed urgently. And that, kids, is called a premonition. Matthias kicked the sheets from him as he leapt up and dashed headlong from the bedroom along the dormitory corridor and helter-skelter down the spiral staircase. Through cavern hole, he clattered in the darkness, stumbling and tripping over furniture, his heart hammering loud and legs pumping like twin pistons. Martin Matthias fell over the top stair went sprawling into Great Hall. He lay on the floor, gazing through the gloom of the tapestry. Martin was there, but he was moving. Was it the breeze? No, it couldn't be. The likeness of the warrior mouse was jiggling about as though it had been tugged in some way. Matthias could see a shadow, but there was nothing to cast it. He jumped to his feet and ran forwards as the picture of Martin was ripped away from the tapestry. A rat held it. There was no doubt in Matthias's mind. It was a rat, entirely black from tip to tail, barely distinguishable from the night itself. Shadow heard the footsteps on the floor behind him. With cold, calculated detachment, he wheeled about as his opponent charged. He was certain to defeat such a small creature in combat, but his orders were to get the picture, not to fight little mice. Besides, there was also the additional hazard that the mouse might hang on to him and shout for help until he came. Like a wraith of oily smoke, Shadow completed a clever double maneuver. Bowling his body into a forward roll, he knocked Matthias down like a skillet. Bound it up, and he slipped around the door, slammed it, and fled off through the cloisters. Matthias sprang up, roaring at the top of his voice, Stop that rat! Stop that rat! Immediately, the mice on sentry duty were alerted. As Shadow ran, he saw Constance dash across the grounds at an angle which cut him off from the stairs up to the ramparts. Switching direction, he made for the next set of stairs, silently cursing the badger, but now he would have to use his climbing rope to descend quickly to the road. Matthias emerged from the abbey. He saw Shadow change direction. Thinking fast, he ran diagonally, catching up with the thief at the foot of the stairs. Throwing himself in a flying tackle, Matthias grabbed Shadow by the legs, sending him crashing onto the lower steps. Still clinging to the tapestry, Shadow wriggled like an eel. Turning over to his back, he kicked savagely at the young boss's head with a free foot. Matthias tried violently, valiantly to hang on, but his larger and heavier opponent kicked him viciously in the face again and again. The big bony foot with its sharp claws pounding and gouging away soon took its toll. Matthias went limp and blacked out. Constance had mounted the far steps. Gaining the ramparts, she ran along, dodging the heaps of rubble. She saw Matthias go down under the onslaught of kicks and ran even faster, impended by mice all around who scattered in panic, thinking they were under mass invasion. The only one besides Constance who had the sense to see what was happening was Cornflower's father. Being near the top of the stairs in the badger, he ran straight into the intruder. Shadow was struggling to get out his climbing rope. Surrender, rat! I've got you! cried Mr. Fieldmouse as he grabbed hold of the thief. But rummaging in his pouch to free the rope, Shadow's claw had closed in on the handle of his dagger. He drew it out swiftly and drove it twice into the field mouse's unprotected body. Constance arrived just as the victim fell wounded. Shadow turned on her with the dagger upraised. Constance swung her paw around in a mighty arc and caught Shadow square on the chin. The force of the blow lifted the thief clean off his feet, and before Constance could grab hold of him, he overbalanced and hurtled over the edge of the parapet with a horrible scream, downwards in a plunge, his body thudding off the unyielding masonry. He landed in the wet roadway with a sickening crunch. Clooney came dashing towards the stricken Shadow with raggy ears scuttling in his wake. Despite his appalling injuries, Shadow managed to lever himself up on one paw. Clooney. I'm hurt. Help me, he gasped. A piece of tapestry lay upon the road. Clooney snatched it up eagerly. Behind him, he could hear the gatehouse bolts beginning withdrawn amid the shouts of angry mice. Ruthlessly, he kicked at Shadow's broken body. Get up and run for it or stay there, fool. I don't carry cripples or bunglers. Leaving the injured Shadow to the mice, Clooney sped off across the road. He covered the width of the ditch with a mighty leap and ran off across the meadows. In open country, he could outdistance any mice that dare follow him. Waving the tapestry, Clooney laughed in exhilaration as he put on an extra burst of speed. Ragnar had panicked completely. He could not jump the ditch, so he scuttled off down the road in the opposite direction from the way they had come. 
a group of mice led by Brother Alf tried fording the ditch and climbing up into the meadow. Unfortunately, the rain had made the going hard and slippery. Clooney was long gone and the tapestry with him. Turning back to Redwall, the pursuers came upon Matthias. He was leaning on Friar Hugo's arm in a dazed condition. Had a faithfully staggered up the road to where Shadow lay, wincing, he cast about, searching the muddy roadway for the fragment of tapestry. It's got to be here somewhere, cried Matthias. He fell upon the injured Shadow, searching his waist pouch. His flat black eyes clouding over, Shadow watching Matthias. Lacan... Lacan... Laconically, he spoke. His voice was strangely calm. Too late, Mouse. Martin is with Clooney now. It was the last thing Shadow ever said. He gave one last shudder and lay dead. Chapter 15 Dawn arrived as if it were the pre where of the previous night's events. Heavy gray skies and steady rain prevailed over Red Wall and the Moss Flower area. Abbot Mortimer looks old and stern as he addressed the assembly in Cavern Hall. The atmosphere was decidedly subdued. Sleeping at your posts? Allowing the enemy into our abbey to steal that which we hold most dear? Is this the way you defend us? The abbot's shoulders slumped wearily. There was an awkward hush. Anger and guilt lay thick upon the air. A kindly old mouse shook his head and held up a cons cons conciliatory paw. Forgive me, friends. I criticize you unjustly. We are all creatures of peace, unskilled in the art of war. Yet when I saw the late rose this morning, I could not help but notice that its leaves were all a shrivel. The tiny rosebuds have died. Martin the warrior is gone from our abbey. He has left Red Wall. We are forsaken. There will be hard and sorrowful days to come without him among us. The mice and woodland creatures shuffled their feet and gazed at the floor. They knew the truth in their father abbot's words. But hope springs eternal. There was one voice raised, that of Matthias. A bit of good news, he said. I've just come from the infirmary. Mr. Fieldmouse is out of danger. He will live. The relief was audible throughout Cavern Hall. Tensions were eased. Even the abbot temporarily forgot his gloomy predictions. Thank you, Matthias, he cried. What heartening news! I must say that the terrible injuries received by Mr. Fieldmouse almost had me believing the worst. But look at yourself, my son. You should be resting. Your face is still swollen after the fight with that black rat. Matthias gave a lopsided grin. He shrugged cheerfully. Don't worry about me, Father Abbot. I'll be all right. The mice smiled with pride. A brave little soldier, Matthias. He put new heart into them. Their resolve strengthened as he continued. Ha! Huh, black rat indeed! He didn't even scratch me! Well, only a bit. But where is he now, this sly one? Deep under the soil, if the insects are doing the job properly. Listen to me, friends. We are a red wall. Our tough lot to kill off. They couldn't finish our bro spike, could they? Why, even the black one armed with a dagger couldn't slay Mr. Fieldmouse. So what's a scratch or two to a mouse like me? Cheers from Matthias sprang to the rafters. Constance sprang up beside him, shouting heartily, That's the spirit, friends! Now let's see you all back out there at your posts. We'll be wide awake this time, and heaven help any dirty rats that come marching up to Redwall this day. With wild yells, very uncharist and uncharacteristic, uncharacteristic of peaceful mice, the friends seized their staves and charged out, fired with new zeal, after a while, Constance accompanied the abbot to see Mr. Fieldmouse, while Matthias went with Methuselah to Great Hall. Together they surveyed the torn tapestry. The young mouse stood with his paws folded, an expression of disgust upon his features. The old gatekeeper patted his shoulder. I know how you feel, Matthias. I could see you were only putting on a brave face for the benefit of the others. That is good. It shows you are learning to be a wise leader. You hide your true feelings and encourage them not to give up hope. Matthias gingerly touching the swellings on his face. 
Aye, that as it may be, old one, but you can see as well as I that Martin is gone. Without him, I do not think we can win. Methuselah nodded in agreement. You are right, my young friend, but what's to be done? Matthias staggered slightly. He leaned against the wall, rubbing a paw across his brow. I don't know. In fact, the only thing I know right now is that the abbot was right. I think I'd better go and lie down for a bit. Refusing Methuselah's help, the young mouse left the old one gazing at the torn tapestry. He tottered off unsteadily in the direction of the dormitory. On the spiral case, he met Cornflower. Hello there, he said, cheering as he could. How's your father? Cornflower looked at Matthias solicitously. He's doing fine, Matthias. Thank you. I'm just going to get some herbs for the abbot. Shouldn't you be lying down? Your face looks terribly puffy. Matthias winced and leaned against the banister. Yes, as a matter of fact, I'm just going to my room for a good long rest. But don't you worry. Before long, I'll make those rats pay dearly for hurting your father. Matthias staggered weakly into his room, but the moment he closed the door, he became a different mouse. With bright, eager eyes, he groped under his bed and brought forth the waist pouch that had belonged to Shadow. Tucking the long dagger into his belt, he wrapped the climbing rope around his shoulder and said aloud to himself, Right, Clooney, you and I have a score to settle. Keeping a mound of earth between himself and Brother Rufus, Matthias silently looped the rope around a projection at the edge of the parapet. Fortunately for him, Rufus was looking in the opposite direction. Matthias started to slide down the rope on the moss flower side of the wall, where the woods came close up to the abbey. He had imagined the descent would be very difficult and surprised himself by handling it with ease, his confidence growing as he slid swiftly and noiselessly to the fern-covered ground. Crouched in the undergrowth, he mentally rehearsed his plan of action. He would go through the woods to St. Ninian's Church, avoiding the road that was being watched by sentries. Once at the church, he would discover where the piece of tapestry was kept, then he would create a diversion of some kind. While Clooney's horde was occupied, he would snatch the tapestry and get back to Redwall with all speed. Mar Matthias's ducked deeper into the ferns. It was soon just a ripple, silent, making through the lush summer green of moss flower to the Church of St. Ninian. And that is where we will end today. And we are on chapter 16 the next time we meet. Oh, thank you for your patience, y'all. Ooh, I keep pausing like I do. Ooh, that song that Chloe Bailey did is gonna be stuck in my head. Anyway, Miss Sherry, thank you for watching. I appreciate you. I love you. Thank you so much for anybody that watches these videos. You know, please enjoy them. Like, share, and subscribe. These are for your entertainment, please. Please enjoy it. Reading is not just fundamental, it is essential. It helps you build up your vocabulary, learn about different languages, learn about people of different cultures, different backgrounds, worldviews, helps broaden your perspectives, and makes you an overall well-rounded person. Whether it's a book, a comic, a magazine, a manga, a, a novel, a novella, a dictionary, a reference material, as long as you are reading, it's a good thing. Peace, love, and hair grease, y'all. I'll 